to the Mark School, Quantum Espresso Mark School. Good afternoon. So uh, it's a great pleasure for us to have this special guest lecture by Professor Stefan Blugel. Thank you, Professor, for uh, accepting our invitation. So uh, let me briefly um, introduce him. Professor Blugel uh, obtained his PhD in physics in 1988 in Aachen University, followed by a postdoc position at the University of Tokyo in Japan. Since 2002, he is director of the Institute of Solid State Research for Schoenstrandtrum ULIC at the Department of Quantum Theory of Materials. And he is also um, professor for theoretical physics at Aachen University. He received several prizes and honors, such as the Friedrich Wilhelm Prize at Aachen University, Heinz Meyer Leibniz Prize for Excellent Achievement in Research Work. He is now leading an ERC synergy grant about three-dimensional magnetization textures. So his uh, research uh, interests are mainly about computational physics in electronic properties of real materials, in particular spin orbit related phenomena in 2D materials, topological insulators, rush by effects, all effects, skirmions, and many other topics. Professor Blugel is a worldwide recognized scientist in computational magnetism, as shown by his publication track record, just a few numbers here. He is also about uh, um, 520 publications and many of them on science and nature top journals with H index of about 72 and uh, cumulative citations about 22,000. So today uh, he will speak about ab initio spin orbitronics, uh, how the tiny spin orbit interaction saves energies in information processing. So I leave the word to Professor Blugel, and I'm very sure that uh, we will all enjoy his talk. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Alessandro. Uh, I would uh, like to start my talk uh, thanking my chairperson, Alessandro, for the nice introduction and the organizer of the Max School for Advanced Materials and Molecular Modeling uh, with uh, Quan Espresso for the invitation. It is my true pleasure um, to present this lecture because I really think that you are the next generation uh, in this world that carries on all the things uh, into the future, uh, at which many people of my generation and the previous generation uh, spend their entire scientific uh, life on, uh, including Stefano Baroni, which you heard this morning, and, uh, and myself, for example. It is a true pity uh, that we cannot meet uh, in person here at a wonderful place of Trieste, um, yeah, I really enjoy the uh, Italian espresso, and I think it would be, have, would be good to have a, a real Italian espresso after the quantum espresso. Um, um, oops, wait a second, how to continue. Um, uh, I really think uh, that you are the rather diverse community uh, who is attending these lectures uh, that are interested in many very cool problems. And maybe some of you have never heard about the word uh, spin orbitronics before. Um, but you maybe notice um, uh, the word spin orbit coupling in this word spin orbitronics. And the spin orbitronics is a compound word actually um, developed by Albert Fert, uh, for spin uh, orbit coupling and uh, electronics. So the spin orbit coupling, mean, maybe you vaguely remember um, from your lectures um, uh, at your university, the spin orbit interaction is the coupling of the spin degree of freedom to the orbital motion of the electron. And the orbital motion of the electron in a crystal means, of course, the crystal motion, the motion of the electrons in the crystal. So maybe you remember this form here of the spin orbit interaction, which is the coupling of the orbital moment uh, to the spin moment. And uh, I have written it in, a, for, in, a, in, the, in the radial symmetric form. You might have seen other forms, but this is the radial symmetric one. And maybe from the atomic physics, you remember this uh, interaction best. Um, you see here the velocity of light, the speed of light. And obviously, it is a relativistic effect. And this tells you already um, um, that this is probably a very small effect. Um, or maybe you, you, you don't consider this too very important. Um, often uh, this spin orbit coupling uh, in the literature is simply abbreviated as SOC 
to because spin orbit coupling to write it all the time and to speak it all the time is a little bit hard. So when you hear SOC, it is the spin orbit coupling. Um, maybe um, uh, you have seen a key uh, in the Espresso code or Espresso con uh, configuration file, and you may be able to switch the spin orbit interaction, the key of spin orbit interaction on and off. And um, yeah, maybe you have switched it already on and you, 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 know, you see hardly any difference um, between switching on and switching off. And this I have done for you. So I have calculated here germanium without spin orbit coupling and germanium with spin orbit coupling. And if you look at it, it looks really nearly like the same. But if you look a little bit careful and with spin orbit interaction, you need good eyes. Uh, if you look a little bit careful, you see here, uh, just uh, uh, at the um, uh, valence band uh, maximum or um, minimum, uh, you see here uh, um, that here you see uh, basically suddenly a small spin splitting, uh, sorry, a band splitting, which you have not seen here. So if you look very careful, you see here the empty band, you see here uh, the, the valence band, and the valence spin uh, splits, uh, splits off into a, sp a split off band here and uh, a heavy hole and light hole uh, band. And now you may say, ah, yeah, this might be 100, uh, 100 uh, milli EV. This is nothing. No, that's not true because 100 milli EV are already, um, yeah, 1000 Kelvin. And if you remember that maybe many transport experiments are maybe done at 10 Kelvin or at 70 Kelvin or at 200 Kelvin or at room temperature, uh, on the level of these experiments, 100 milli EV is a huge number. So we're dealing here with small numbers, but we're dealing here with numbers which are absolutely irrelevant. I would like to uh, come to a second example. And if you do not understand everything what I'm saying today, it is no problem because next week, Alessandro, our chairman, will give you an introductory lecture to the subject. And maybe I give you a little, little bit more an overview while he goes into the nitty gritty details and explains you all the details. So here I show you uh, another example, which is the uh, band structure of ferromagnetic iron. Iron is ferromagnetic. And maybe you remember, then you have a pair of, uh, uh, of bands, which are basically the same, but shifted by a certain energy. So for example, um, you see here these black bands, and you see here the red bands. And you see here uh, the band structure of these dx and uh, dy states, uh, dxy and dyz states. When you see that these states again here, these are the minority states and these are the majority states. And between we have an energy difference, which is basically the, what we call the exchange splitting. Everything is super fine, everything is great. But now we switch on the, the spin orbit interaction. You know, if you look at it, uh, it first of all, it looks rather the same. You have here, you have here the, 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 the bands here, uh, you have here the bands here, you have here the bands here. But if you look a little bit more careful, you realize, yeah, okay, uh, uh, without spin orbit interaction, spin up and spin down states are eigenstates of the SZ operator. But with spin orbit interaction, that's not true anymore. Spin up states and spin down states can mix. And for example, you see here, you have here a state here, here, an unoccupied state um, here, which uh, has a crossing. This is just the state between uh, the DX and YZ. And here you see you have the same crossing, but uh, the equivalent state here has a, a gap opening. And the same happens here, for example, here you have a crossing between the um, majority state and the minority state. And it, exactly at this crossing, you have here an opening, but you have no opening here. Please notice this band structure is uh, plotted along the gamma H line and the gamma H3 line. This is this line from gamma H to gamma H3. These are, these, the crystals is identical. But what you do now is you have a magnetic structure and due to the spin orbit interaction, you translate the magnetic structure into the crystal structure due to the spin orbit interaction. And you break the symmetry. You break the symmetry of the crystal. Your crystal looks cubic, but in reality it becomes tetragonal. And what you see is then suddenly due to this magnetization direction, um, the electronic structure along this direction and the electronic structure along this direction is different. And you see this tiny gap opening. 
Now you say, what, what is this tiny gap opening? Who cares about this? But what happens is due to this gap opening and to the fact that the easy exit, that the magnetization direction um, has different band structures, it means also that the different magnetization directions have different energies. And there is suddenly one magnetization direction relative to the crystal lattice, which has a different energy than this than the other magnetization direction with respect to the magnetic to the crystal structure. And this we call the magnetic anisotropy energy. The energy uh, scale is about 0.5 to 1 milli EV, not EV, milli EV. This is not a typo. So remember this morning, Stefano uh, Baroni, Professor Baroni has talked about phonons. This is also a small energy scale, but this phonon energy scale might be in the order of 100 milli EV at the prion zone edge or 200 milli EV at the prion zone edge. Here we're talking about 0.05 or 50 micro EV to 1 milli EV. And here you see a totally ex over exaggerated picture of the magnetic anisotropy. So you see that in this, the length here is the energy. You see in certain energy directions, like the 1101 direction, this particular case, the energy is high. And in another direction, the energy is low. And therefore, um, uh, so, this is, so this, is the, this is the magnetic anisotropy energy. And now you say, what is the importance of this very small number? This is a very important number because it is important for all electromotors. So a, a modern car, like an e-car, uh, has about 200 to 300 engines, electrical engines in the car. So you want to move the, the window, you want to drive, you want to uh, use the wiper plates, you want to change the mirrors, everything has uh, motors. And these motors require a core, a magnetic core to save energy. And this magnetic core needs a certain material, which we has a certain magnetic anisotropy, we call that magnetically hard material. The same materials which you have in your headphones. And there is a, a huge interest in these um, uh, materials. And there is a huge activity worldwide to produce the right material for the right energy scale, the right uh, temperature scale, uh, environmentally appropriate. So this is a huge field, but I'm not talking about this field today. I only want to make you aware that 50 milli EV or uh, 50 micro EV or one milli EV can change a total perspective of an entire industry. So this spin orbit coupling, uh, maybe uh, you never heard of, maybe you have never interested, interested in, has uh, um, fascinating realizations and ramifications in a solid and has also uh, attached to it are also fancy names of interesting people like the Raspa effect, the Dresselhaus effect, the Edelstein effect, the magnetoelectric effect. We talked about the magnetic anisotropy related to these are the orbital moments. We have a spin orbit talk. We have the jalochinsky moria interaction. We have chiral magnets and skirmions. We have all the Hall effects, the anomalous Hall effect, the spin Hall effect, the chiral Hall effect, the quantum Hall effect, the topological spin Hall effect. We have topological and churn insulators. We have spin relaxation mechanisms like Elliot Jaffet and Dirk Novbrell. We have the Gilbert damping. So there is an entire zoo of uh, phenomena which are in this way or that way of great relevance, which hinge on the spin orbit interaction. And uh, I cannot explain all this uh, in my lecture, but I would like to make you aware that based on this spin orbit interaction, there is an entire field which we call the spin orbitronics. And you, uh, this, for example, the spin orbit interaction is finally responsible for a, uh, creates an interaction between atoms, between the spins of atoms, which is the jalojinsky moria interaction. This jalojinsky moria interaction can form chiral magnetic textures. One of them is the magnetic, uh, chiral magnetic skirmion. It's a finite size object of 10, 20, 30 nanometers and behaves like a particle. It is ultra robust, you know, and have a very efficient electrodynamics and or a very efficient dynamics. And this, uh, there is the hope that such an entity may be an entity for an information carrier with which you can store information. 
Then, of course, you know, this um, uh, is very robust because it we call it has a topological nature. It can be described by a topological, non-trivial topological invariant in the real space. But it's been orbit interactions also for, responsible for materials which have topological invariants in the momentum space in the electronic structure. They produce due to the um, surface bulk boundary uh, correspondence, they produce edge states and surface states, which are to also topologically protected. And therefore they are very robust and have a very small resistivity. They can be described by the topology in the momentum space, but there's also an effect which we call the spin orbit torque, which is described by the topology in a mixed space in the momentum space and in the spin space. And this spin orbit torque is a phenomenon which, uh, which is if you drive a current to your system, you produce a magnetic torque on these chiral spin textures, for example. And it allows you, for example, to move this uh, chiral spin texture with high speed. And you don't need for this um, an external magnetic field. So that you can basically integrate that into a technology. And you need very little power. It is scalable to a device. And this allows you the manipulation of this skirmion. It allows you, this uh, topological materials allows you to control the, the detection of the, of the, of the uh, skirmion. You can count suddenly skirmions, which go through a wire. And this, at the end of the day, you can build up an entire technology uh, on this uh, with low power consumption, uh, topological robustness, you can even go into uh, uh, Majorana fermions and quantum computing. So this is the, the big scope of the spin orbitronics. And in this lecture here, I will pick out a few things to make you give you a feeling for the field without going into all the details. Spin orbitronics fits into a technology based on magnetism, which already exists. And uh, maybe um, uh, you know that I would say 90% of all information worldwide is stored on magnetic hard disks. It is cheap. It has a high uh, capacity. It's extremely reliable. And uh, it is uh, capable of further developments. And without this hard disk, all this uh, cloud computing would not be possible because the hard disk is where the, all these big uh, data centers are, they are using these hard disks. Of course, not these light, small ones, but use hard disk farms. And uh, if you look at uh, the, um, uh, basically uh, the, the shipped capacity in, in exabytes, you see that uh, uh, the hard disk, which is this blue uh, section here, is basically, uh, it is still um, expected to grow. And what you also see, it's, it's, it's a huge fraction that all the information is stored on this uh, hard disk. And what we realize is there is also a Moore's law for digital data and uh, the doubling um, of the data, of the created data uh, increases every two years. And therefore, uh, oh, even now, um, you have already 10% of the worldwide electricity use goes for information technology. Um, and uh, if you think about uh, computing, you probably realize also that uh, computing takes a quite amount of energy and the size of the computers, which we can afford, are actually limited by the, electric, by the electrical power. So there is a strong motivation uh, to um, develop a technology where we can take data from a memory into a compute unit or store data on a device with much less energy. And therefore we need uh, novel paradigms for energy efficient memory and computing. And um, uh, uh, these skirmions, uh, which I've talked about, they might be a path to this uh, uh, to, to disruptive change in the uh, information technology. So how could you, could you think about a skirmion? Think about a ferromagnetic state. So you have this red thing is a ferromagnetic state. And um, 
And on this ferromagnetic state, think of this ferromagnetic state like a, an ice hockey field. Of course, not everybody in the world you have seen an ice hockey field, but maybe on TV. Um, so you have this ice hockey field, and in this ice hockey field, you have an ice hockey puck, which is a hard rubber disc. And this hard rubber disc resembles these skirmions. And if you have this spin orbit torque, they run around here on this ice hockey field. But these, uh, these uh, skirmions are not arbitrary magnetic structures. No, they are topologically protected magnetic structures. And what happens is that each magnetization points in a, in a unique, unique magnetization direction. And um, you can put now these skirmions on basically on a, on a memory, which is not a hard disk memory, but a racetrack memory. And then you have, um, uh, then you can save a normal, yeah, you can use that type of uh, registered, uh, uh, registered type memory to save enormous amount of energy. And the huge, huge uh, unique properties of the magnetic skirmions is that you have nano sized particles which guarantee high uh, data density. They are topologically protected, they you know, uh, provide thermal stability, and they are very fast. This requires or uh, this enables uh, high data high data flows, and you can also use the two dimensionality because um, you can uh, not only go in in one direction but you can may go in various directions. And uh, so these uh, the uh, these properties uh, give you uh, an idea of a new generation of magnetic memory, which is the solid state memory. So no me me mechanical parts are moving, and therefore it would be a low power memory. And you can also do programmatic logic uh, with this memory. Uh, so you, you can uh, uh, reconfigure the memory to have different uh, OR and XOR structures. You can do that uh, massively parallel uh, for in-memory computing. And what is a great advantage is you can also do it, uh, you can also use this object for neuromorphic computing, um, which guarantees uh, low power consumption. And it is a scalable architecture. So there's a lot of future into this, but now uh, before I get carried away by all these possibilities, which we have in the future, I come back a little bit more to the basics. I remind you, um, if we have a non-magnetic state without spin-orbit interaction, you may have a band structure of a certain band on a certain k vector, and uh, these are typically block states. And these block states are twofold degenerate because we have a spin-up and a spin-down down state with the same energy. But if you switch on now the spin-orbit interaction in your code, uh, then you will realize that this uh, spin-up and spin-down are actually not good quantum numbers. Instead, the spin, due to the spin orbit interaction, you can mix the spin up and spin down states. But of course, the spin orbit interaction is small. So we call this one state spin up because most of this state is spin up, although there is a little bit spin down. And we call, uh, uh, we call a spin, uh, spin down because most of it is spin down and there's only a little bit spin up. And uh, so basically this factor A is large and this factor B is small. And this is called the elliot jaffet parameter. And actually, since the spin orbit interaction is a small quantity, you feel you can do spin, uh, we can do perturbation theory. And what enters in this perturbation theory is the spin orbit interaction. And this, of course, uh, you remember that uh, you have this sigma, uh, this Pauli matrices, and you have off diagonal elements of the Pauli matrices, which are responsible for the spin flip, uh, for the spin flip matrix elements. So you have a spin here, maybe a spin up, can flip into a spin down due to these off diagonal elements of the spin orbit matrix. And in some instances, uh, you have crazy Fermi surfaces. And uh, in some instances, you have uh, so-called hotspots where this denominator becomes very small and this uh, a prefactor here, B, becomes suddenly very large, maybe 50%. And uh, this determines the lifetime uh, of the um, of, of spins. So if you 
if you imagine you have a solid here, for example, osmium, and then you have a spin current. Somebody externally produces a spin current for you. For example, you run a current to a magnetic materials, then you have a spin current. When you put the spin current into the solid, then the spin orientation matters. And you see that in some areas, if you inject the spin like this, in some areas, you have so-called spin hotspots where this B becomes very large. And if you integrate now all this B over the Fermi surface, you get, you get the inverse of the spin lifetime. And I'm saying in this configuration, the spin lifetime is roughly one over 20. But if you have now another configuration, for example, you, you, you shoot in your spin in a different configuration uh, with a different magnetization axis to have a different spin current, then uh, the same, same Fermi surface will produce at other places uh, a spin flip hot area. And then you can do it the same. You integrate now this Fermi surface, which is the same Fermi surface, but the matrix elements are different on this Fermi surface. Um, and then you see suddenly your lifetime has changed. It's not only, uh, so the inverse of the lifetime is not, or the lifetime is not 20, but here the lifetime is 30, so 13. So it is, uh, uh, much, much smaller. And therefore you have a giant anisotropy in the lifetime of a spin current. And this, uh, uh, you, you can now think of a Gedanken experiment or a real experiment. So imagine you have here a mag magnetic material and this magnetic material has the spin polarization pointing up. Now you run a current through that system and the current to that system, uh, electrical current, goes through that system and becomes spin polarized. And now you have a spin polarized current entering a non-magnetic material, for example, this osmium. And then you have a spin current uh, in, this, in this circle. But parallel, parallel to this, you have a, uh, a diffusive current, uh, which diffuses into your solid. And now you can detect this uh, current by your detector. So what you do is you measure uh, the voltage difference as a function uh, of the position. And this I basically have done for you here. Uh, and you get such a curve because you get a typical diffusion behavior. And the diffusion uh, length depends on your spin lifetime. And now you can do the same um for a, a material with a different direction and what you will see is that you get a different lifetime so that means basically you can polarize spins you have to get a spin diffusion which is different for different directions of the spin current or polarization of the spin current i should say so this was one example uh, but let me come back to our spin to the the importance of spin orbit coupling in relation to the inversion of the spin um, of the spin inversion symmetry. So imagine you have spin inversion symmetry, uh, or space inversion. Sorry, you have space inversion symmetry. Then you can show that uh, these two uh, wave functions lead are corresponding to states. These are Bloch wave functions corresponding to states which are degenerate. This is this particular case. How do you prove this? You take this wave function here, you apply time reversal symmetry. That means um, you have to take this uh, Pauli matrix sigma times minus i times the conjugate times the conjugate. And what it does for you is your time inversion means k goes to minus k, and uh, you also have to flip the spin. Uh, time inversion means spin flip. You go from here to here, and you go from here to here. And now you remember that you have space inversion symmetry. You go from minus from k to minus k, and you're ending up at this Bloch vector again, and you end up in uh, the wave function with opposite spin. So these two uh, are totally degenerate. But the energy, the state is totally degenerate. So what we have, what I have shown you is that uh, 
for time reversal and space inversion symmetry, the energy of the K point spin up and the energy of the K point spin down is the same. But if you break this sp uh, space inversion symmetry, then it is not anymore the case because then you have time reversal symmetry only. And the energy of K spin up is the same as the energy of K of minus K spin down. But the energy of the, uh, the, 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 the eigen energy of uh, K spin up is not the same as the eigen energy of K spin down. So that means if you are now looking at a particular K point, the degeneracy of uh, spin up and spin down states is lifted. What does it mean? It means this electron, maybe he has had never, this electron might have never heard about the spin orbit interaction. But what this electron understands is that its counterpart, the spin down electron or the spin up electron, has not the same energy for the same k point. In other words, the spin orbit interaction produces locally a k-dependent uh, uh, magnetic field, a, a k-dependent magnetic field omega of k. And uh, that is very important to realize that if you have a, if you broken space inversion symmetry, your spin orbit interaction has the feature of a local magnetic field in your solid. On this local magnetic field is very large. So a typical example of a broken space inversion symmetry symmetric situation is the surface. On the surface, you have uh, electrons running around the surface. Maybe they are delocalized. They are wonderful. They are characterized by the K parallel wave vectors. Everything is fine. Uh, but I would like to remind you that we have in this surface, of course, we have our Coulomb potential. Uh, one over R potential and exchange correlation potential and electron electron interaction. But we have these uh, basically symmetric potentials here. But if you come closer to the surface, you have the, 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 this, this symmetric potential is broken. And what you have is a finite gradient of this potential. And this finite gradient produces a gradient of a potential is something like an electric field. And this electric field. Uh, in the rest frame of these electrons, they don't think about this electric field. In the rest frame of these electrons, this electric field is Lorentz transformed. This becomes a B field. And this B field interacts with these uh, spins of the electrons. And this produces, uh, besides the original interaction of the electrons, an interaction which is has this notion here. It is a spin orbit interaction. The effect is called the rush by effect. And basically, you, what you see here, you couple the spin degree of freedom to this time not to the uh, orbital uh, motion, but to the uh, kinetic motion uh, of the uh, uh, electrons. And this is also a spin orbit interaction. And this uh, parameter here is called the rush bar constant. And this rush bar constant depends on the spin orbit strength, the asymmetry of the wave functions, the orbitals, and the S of the S, whether it's S or P or D, and so on. And this is, of course, our motivation to understand the strength of this uh, uh, rush bar effect. And here I show you uh, now uh, uh, an example. This is basically the rush bar effect on the gold surface, gold 111. You see here the bulk states, which are totally unimportant, you see the famous uh, L gap of this uh, particular uh, surface. And what you see is here the surface states, and you see that the surface state, there is a the degeneracy of the surface state is lifted, except for k equals zero. And here is the uh, corresponding experiment to it. I think it's from uh, Reinhardt. Uh, it's a photo emission experiment. And uh, you please notice the scale here, and the scale here is slightly different. So I basically, I rescale here this experiment. And in photo emission, you can only see occupied states. So you see here, it is a good comparison between theory and experiment. And if you look a little bit more with a, with a zoom into it, you see you have here a degeneracy at each K point. The degeneracy is lifted. 
um, you see here you have uh, one, you have a relation between this, the, the spin and the momentum. Um, here you have the spin up states, here you have the spin down states, but here it's exactly vice versa because this here is the spin down state and this here is the spin uh, up state. So basically you have a spin momentum locking. Now this spin momentum locking has a great consequence. Um, ah, yeah, I should say first, so uh, where is actually uh, this rush bar strength coming from? Now, I think if you a little bit look a little bit more carefully on the surface, of course, uh, in reality, you have atoms on the surface, not only homogeneous electron gas where everything is moves, you have atoms on the surface. Or maybe we can circumscribe these atoms by spheres. We call this a muffin chin sphere. And in this sphere, you have this uh, one over R potential here and other contributions to exchange and correlation and so on. But you remember that this uh, spin orbit interaction is somehow related by the strength uh, proportional to derivative of the potential with respect to the uh, uh, the gradient of the potential with respect to the radius. And now you should think the following. Your wave function has a tail and has a head. The tail is always out there in the homogeneous electron gas as doing a, as a block wave vector, is propagating, but it has also a, a head. And this head feels this one over R potential and it has strong oscillation here. It means it feels the depth of the potential. It's running around like crazy and producing a, a heavy mass and producing this spin orbit interaction. And sometimes these electrons is far away uh, with a certain probability in this homogeneous electron gas picture. And some, in some probability it is in this tail uh, where it sees these strong spin orbit interaction. And if you put this all together, you can ask yourself, where in the hell is the spin orbit interaction created? And then you see 99% of this spin orbit interaction comes from a very small region uh, in, uh, around the atom. And I've plotted this here. As you see here, a typical a sphere radius might be uh, 2.5 atomic units. And you see 99% or yeah, close to 90% 90 or 99% you have already at uh, 0.3 uh, atomic units uh, of the sphere. So it's a, the radius might be 10%, the volume might be, I don't know, uh, you know, 1,000. This you should keep in mind. And then the next question is, um, I told you it depends somehow on the gradient of the potential. That is true, but it depends also on the asymmetry of the wave function, because at the end you have to calculate matrix elements. And therefore you see uh, the contribution of this uh, uh, rush bar parameter here, or of this uh, uh, spin orbit strength, or maybe better the rush bar parameter. You see 60% uh, comes from the surface atoms, but the other 40% uh, uh, come basically from deeper lying atoms. So you have some depth profile, which contributes to the uh, rush bar effect. So why are I telling you all this on the rush bar effect? Because it has a strong implication to magnetic interactions. And this I would like to discuss with you now. This is the Jaloginsky uh, moria interaction. The Jaloginsky moria interaction, um, um, I would like to discuss now. What happens is, imagine you have two uh, two atoms on the surface, and if you have two atoms on the surface, um, uh, and you have to do your conduction electrons, uh, the atoms are magnetic; they have a local magnetic moment. The electrons come, the electrons scatter on these electrons on this uh, sorry on these atoms with this uh, spin. The electrons propagate uh, to the other side uh, to this uh, second atom. And uh, maybe they propagate back. And this uh, propagating to one side and propagating back, uh, this causes an interaction. And this we call the Heisenberg interaction. And this we can formally describe something like um, 
Yeah, the interaction is the, uh, the, the conduction electron scatters and is propagated, it scatters, it's propagating back, and this leads to the interaction. But if I have now rushed by electrons, then I get an additional term here, and this rush by electrons, due to the fact that these rush by electrons have a certain behavior due to the spin orbit interaction, produce an additional term here, which is this Jaroginsky Mori interaction. And uh, let me remind you, uh, the, the symmetry breaking of this um, uh, at the surface produces these rush by electrons. And uh, therefore, these propagating electrons have not only a term which comes from the uh, ordinary electrons, it has also a contribution which comes actually from the spin orbit interaction uh, of the rush by electrons. And uh, so you have here these, um, these greens, we call this the greens function. You have here the greens function twice and the spin orbit interaction twice, spin orbit interaction is small, the square of the spin orbit interaction is even smaller. So that means, um, forget it, you only stay to linear terms in the spin orbit interaction. I can write out the linear terms in the spin orbit interaction. I remind you at the fermionic rules of uh, Pauli poly matrices. Uh, so sigma times A and sigma times B gives you AB and sigma cross B. And if you put that in, um, you see you get this uh, term here. But this uh, looks like this term. But you also see um, you have a, a propagating term from one to two and from two to one. And they don't cancel because propagation of a k vector means propagation of a minus k vector and the spin is down and therefore it adds up. And this gives you exactly uh, the, the remaining contribution here. Uh, and we can not only uh, also uh, get this uh, algebraic form of the jaroginsky moria interaction, we can also get a description of the uh, jaroginsky moria in terms of the electronic structure. So what I have shown you is there's been orbit interaction in combination with the structure inversion symmetry produces an, uh, a, uh, a new interaction. And this new, new, inter new interaction we call a chiral interaction. Why? Because if you look at the magnetic of this uh, pair of atoms with this particular magnetic structure, you see that the cross product of this points in the y direction. So maybe this is direction towards you. Whereas uh, if you rotate, so here the spin structure is rotating clockwise, but here the spin structure is rotating counterclockwise. And in counterclockwise, this cross product maybe points into my direction. And what you see is uh, if you uh, rotate left and if you rotate right has a different energy and the difference in the energy depends on the sign of this jaroginsky moria strength. And the sign of the jaroginsky moria strength depends on the details of the electronic structure. So I have, to, I have showed you that uh, the, in, the break of the inversion symmetry uh, is a path to chiral magnetism. And uh, of course, we had to learn a lot about this uh, strength of the jaroginsky moria interaction as function of the electronic structure and so on. And uh, this uh, jaroginsky moria interaction, uh, you know, is really the path to chiral magnetism, which you can see, for example, that uh, ground states become, the magnetic ground state become, can become a spiral uh, because if, this, uh, if the chiral interaction is strong enough, the ferromagnetic state is not any more stable. And you have a chiral, uh, you have a, a, a spiral, which spirals only in one one-handedness. In this case, for example, counterclockwise, whereas the mirror image, where the magnetization uh, uh, spirals um, clockwise, does not exist. And here's an experimental proof of this situation. You also, it, it's also responsible for, these are one-dimensional magnetic structures, it's also responsible for the two-dimensional magnetic structures. And here you see an example of a skirmion, which is calculated and measured experimentally. It is also responsible for chiral domain balls, 
these chiral domain walls are extremely stable uh, because they don't flip to uh, to the to the uh, energetically equivalent one, and therefore you can move it with high speed. It is also responsible for the it also changes the magnon dispersion. Um, uh, basically, uh, you have um, a non reciprocity in the magnon dispersion. A right rotating magnon and a left rotating magnon has a different uh, has a different uh, uh, dispersion. So now I'm um, looking a little bit at the time, but maybe we have still ten minutes. We started a little bit later. Um, so let me say a word about this Skirmion simulation in description. So uh, I have introduced to you, without much undo, this Heisenberg interaction, this jalojinsky moria interaction. I mentioned the magnetic anisotropy. There are also other, some other parts which are currently not of my interest. It is a dipole-dipole interaction. And, uh, you know, uh, basically, if you have calculated all these parameters, gij and dij and k, then you can put it into an atomistic spin a dynamics program and you can calculate all these magnetic structures and you can simulate the lifetime and the dynamics and all this. And you can do it even on your mobile phone. Uh, you can download this code, it's free for you and uh, you can play with it. Originally the code was made for high school teacher, but uh, the experimentalists liked the code so much so that we developed this code further uh, for, for playing and for, uh, with this uh, spin dynamics. Um, but you know, sometimes you know it is all this uh, sp um, um, uh, spin lattice models is a little bit complicated. You want to do also some analytic work, and therefore you often go from this atomistic spin model to the micromagnetic spin model. And this you can do if you, for example, take a long wavelength approximation. You take the magnetization at point J. Uh, look at the magnetization at point J and expand the magnetization at point I and you do a Taylor expansion. And then you come basically to this micromagnetic model. It is well known. Uh, it developed in the 60s. And of course, we all, we all want to relate these parameters A to these, uh, these parameters G. They are related due to these uh, approximations. Uh, but at the end, of course, we want to calculate these quantities from uh, first principles. And so there are methods and ways to do, to relate the total energy, which you can, as function of the rotation of the magnetic structure. For example, you introduce a spiral and the spiral changes the energy. Like in this behavior, the uh, spin spiral with a certain Q vector. And then you can basically uh, calculate the spin stiffness, which is this A, and you calculate uh, the derivative of the energy with respect to Q gives you this jalajinsky moria strength, which we call here the spiralization. And you can calculate the magnetic anisotropy. And you will learn this, how to do that uh, next week. And uh, then you can, for example, um, uh, calculate uh, these your parameters. Uh, or you can do um, a principle called uh, infinitesimal rotations. You take the magnetic state, you, uh, you basically change a pair of atoms slightly, and then calculate the change of the total energy with respect to these uh, small changes. And this gives you basically uh, these uh, Heisenberg and Jalajinsky Moria parameters. And you can do that with different codes, uh, with a, with a, for example, with the Guan Espresso code. We are doing it with the FLIR code and the KKR code because we are more used to that code. Now, let me say one word about this energy functional. Uh, this energy, this micromagnetic energy functional, I have shown here. Here is the uh, exchange, the magnetic anisotropy, and for example, external magnetic field. And the question which I would like to address is I'm putting now in this micromagnetic energy functional a skirmion, which I showed you before. And um, what I'm doing now is I take this skirmion into this equation and scale a little bit the radius of the skirmion and look at the stability of the skirmion. So I take my skirmion. 
I basically squeeze the square muon a little bit uh, by uh, basically scaling up the radius of this magnetization or make it a little bit larger uh, this one, this way or that way. If I do that, of course, oh, sorry. Um, if I do that, uh, the energy depends somehow on this stretching parameter. You see here, you have here a der first derivative square. Due to the scaling, this becomes one over lambda square. Then I have here, uh, due to this dr square, a lambda square. And if I plot now the energy as function of this lambda, uh, I see, uh, what do I see? I see that the energy has a quadra has a parabola behavior as function of this lambda. And what you see is the minimum of the energy is that lambda equals zero. In other, in, in other way, it means if you put your skirmion in this micromagnetic energy functional, your skirmion is squeezed to death when it doesn't exist because it has the radius zero. Um, this changes in one dimension. Because in one dimension, if you have structures in one dimension, this still scales like one over lambda square, but here you have um, something which depends only on lambda, scales only with lambda. And therefore you see your energy functional looks like something like um, it has this form, it has a minimum, and this minimum is actually uh, your domain wall. So a domain wall is a stable object in one dimension. But if you add now the jalodzinski moria interaction, which has this form of the chiral symmetry breaking, you get here an additional term which goes proportional to the derivative. And therefore, you have here in your energy function in a different term, which is one over lambda, and this guarantees you a minimum. And that means the jalodzinski moria interaction stabilizes these two-dimensional objects. Um, maybe I skip this part and come to the skirmian radius. Um, so we have studied this micromagnetic energy functional. What I can do now, I'm saying my skirmion is anyway axial symmetric. It doesn't have to be, but I assume it's axial symmetric. Symmetric, and if I put now these axial symmetric uh, conditions into my equations in the energy functional, I can ask myself what is the optimal profile such that I um, can minimize. Uh, which optimal profile? minimizes the, uh, the, uh, the energy of the skirmion. And if I do that, I'm coming to a, um, a skirmion profile equation, which is terrible, complicated, very nonlinear, but I can solve it, for example, numerically uh, by certain boundary conditions, saying that the spin inside the skirmion points down and outside of the skirmions, it matches to the ferromagnetic state. And what enters in this equation is a dimensionless parameter, uh, which is basically this kappa, which depends on all these parameters, which I have first calculated by ab initio. And um, my equation is written in the units of this domain wall width, which I showed you before. And what you see is, uh, this is the solution. This is the radius as function of this parameter kappa. First of all, you see not much. It is a very nonlinear functional, but if you zoom in into this uh, kappa, you see small changes of this kappa, small changes of these material parameters give you large changes in this radius. Um, and uh, uh, this uh, we have actually looked at. Now my time is a little bit uh, short. I'm running out of time. Uh, I have some done these skirmion applications. A very important material stack to put these skirmions into reality 
is the magnetic multilayer because the magnetic multilayer offers you um, a great versatility what you can do to, to massage the magnetic structure such that your skirmion and all these properties which you need are at the right curie temperature, at the right size, at the right st stability. Um, all the conditions which you want to have for a skirmion in, in a technology, room temperature, fast speed, uh, stability, all this can be massaged by such uh, multi layers. So you need heavy materials like platinum, for example, or iridium for a large spin orbit interaction. You need ferromagnetic material, cobalt, for example. You have to organize this material such that your magnetization is, um, is um, uh, perpendicular. Then what you want is the ferromagnetic layer should couple and the ferromagnetically to the next layer. For this, we have an RKKY material. This should be antiferromagnetic to minimize the dipole energy um, and so on. Uh, and you have choices of the thickness, the layer composition, the growth condition, and um, the, the coupling strength. And uh, uh, so you have a huge uh, perspective available. And what we have done recently is we have calculated uh, 14 different uh, multi layers. So we have taken uh, cobalt platinum, which is the technologically most important one, and varied uh, 14 different elements here itrium, zirconium, niobium, molybdenum, technetium, ruthenium, up to cadmium, copper, zinc, and looked which one produce room temperature, which one couple endoferromagnetically. For example, here, those uh, in, in, uh, in, in gray couple and they're ferromagnetically, those in a pink or pinkish orange, uh, they couple uh, ferromagnetically. And if you put all this together, uh, you, we could calculate the skirmion radius as function of the cobalt layers. You see, we can reproduce this very funky uh, behavior where it's small changes of the cobalt numbers give you a large changes in the skirmion radius. And so if you want to say that, for example, I want to have a skirmion radius of 10 nanometers, which is technologically good, maybe uh, these compositions, uh, depending whether you have copper, for example, 10 layers of cobalt would be, for example, a, a important choice for skirmion radius at zero field. Uh, with this, uh, maybe I should stop uh, due to the time uh, maybe I uh, move on to here. Oops. Uh, I uh, should thank all my collaborators, the bright young graduate students, PhD students, uh, postdocs, and of course also senior people. And of course I benefited from all of them, in particular Gustav Bielmeier, Nikolai Kiselev, Samir Lumis, Yuri Mokrusov. Uh, but uh, also Hong Ying Jia, Markus Hoffmann, the, all the screaming work, Gideon, do, who did the uh, spirit code, Fabian Lux, who did a lot of work on the Kyle Hall effect, on the chirality of the systems, and also on the screaming stability. Uh, I thank many organizations, but in particular, Max. Without Max, we could not have our code on this level. Uh, and uh, uh, without Max, we would not be able to enjoy our collaboration with the um espresso uh, group one espresso group and with this i thank you very much for your attention and i'm happy to uh, ask questions thank you thank you very much for this uh, very very nice talk uh, very interesting so uh, i would ask us if there, are, if there is some question from the from the audience here in zoom i think there was uh, some question before, maybe one can raise the hand and ask directly. No, okay. So, please, Nikita. Yes, hello, and uh, thank you for your fascinating uh, presentation. I just have a simple question concerning the beginning. You raised that the energy scale is just about one me. How about 
uh, does this effect uh, suck uh, is uh, survive at room temperature and uh, how about the magnon phonon interaction does it affect uh, I don't know the application is it destroy or is it sensitive for, to apply the magnetic properties for them um, uh, the uh, the effect itself is indeed very small but uh, the Curie temperature itself the effect does not determine the Curie temperatures in systems of three dimensions. So if you have a three-dimensional magnet, for example, the Curie temperature is basically determined by the Heisenberg interaction and not by the um, spin orbit interaction. And therefore, as long as your magnetic system uh, has a Curie temperature, is below the Curie temperature, has a magnetization, uh, the um, the uh, magnetocrystalline anisotropy is there. But I should like to mention that the magnetocrystalline anisotropy has a different temperature behavior uh, than uh, the uh, magnetization. It uh, becomes smaller faster. Uh, so uh, the hardness of the magnetic hardness of the material <clears throat> is reduced faster. And that is, of course, a problem if you have put, put your, um, for example, if you have an electric engine in a, uh, in a car, if the car becomes warmer, the hardness of the uh, material goes down and maybe it does not perform so well anymore. And therefore, uh, we have to have, therefore, there is a research development putting, increasing the Curie temperature, making the material harder at higher temperature. Now let me come down to two dimensions. If you have a magnetic interaction, that if you have a two-dimensional system, a strictly two-dimensional system, which is totally magnetically isotropic, then you don't have a Curie temperature. The Curie temperature is zero. Then the spin-orbit interaction, which produces this magnetic anisotropy, stabilizes actually the magnetic phase against fluctuations. So it is. Uh, then it is a very important ingredient for a finite Curie, Curie temperature. Uh, and then you, was, you had a question about magnon phonon. So uh, the magnon phonon, yeah, there is, uh, so typically the magnon phonon interaction, um, uh, so the, the magnon phonon interaction is to come, is, uh, the interaction where the magnon and the phonon hybridizes. This typically is an interaction between the controlled by the Heisenberg interaction, which controls the magnons. Sometimes also the, the dipolar interaction, which control the magnon and the phonon. Uh, the uh, spin orbit interaction does not play an important role here. Uh, but the spin orbit interaction has a slight impact on the magnon dispersion or maybe can shift the resonance uh, of the magnon phonon interaction. Okay, the there, answer is, the question. there is another question from Amelia, please. Hi, um, so are these skirmions, do they tend to be stable at room temperature under normal conditions or do, do these have to exist at like extremely low temperatures or something? Because I'm a first year, I'm probably not going to explain this intelligently, but the electrochemistry group I'm in has been seeing some very strange effects with our thin magnetic films that we don't know how to explain. So I find this very exciting, but I'm not sure if it's possible that we are accidentally creating skirmions that are influencing our results. Um, you have skirmions at low temperatures and you have skirmions at above room temperature. Okay. Typically, uh, if you work in the world of ultra thin films, one layer iron or cobalt on iridium and platinum, your skirmions are very small, maybe three, four nanometers. And uh, typically these films have a very low curry temperature. So you also use skirmion has a very low Curie temperature, maybe 
I say a number, 20 Kelvin. But if you go to these multi-layers, which I have discussed, you can uh, easily have skirmance at room temperature. It's not a problem. And actually that is the motivation to do skirmance at room temperature. But okay. typically skirmance are larger, typically say 30 nanometers, 20 nanometers, 30 nanometers. So it depends a little bit, what is the size of the skirmance your colleagues in the lab are seeing? Thank you for the answer. So let's take a, a question from the streaming. Should we consider SOC for all 2D materials? I think it was related to surface um, effects of I, SOC. I would, I would say yes. Uh, I would say yes. Um, uh, SOC can be very important for 2D materials. I, uh, because some of these materials, uh, can, or many of these, not all, some of these materials, for example, contain uh, selenite, telluride, these are of course heavy materials, and they are P, uh, P materials, uh, P, materials with P electrons. And P electrons are typically uh, have very strong spin orbit interactions. So I can easily imagine uh, that such interactions are important. And in particularly, they changed the Heisenberg model to very anisotropic models, for example, like the Kitaev model. And therefore, I think uh, the spin orbit interactions are important. That they are always the dominating one. I cannot uh, say it depends a little bit on the details. It depends also on the crystal symmetry. It depends also on your substrate. Okay. But you know, uh, without uh, considering it, uh, would be uh, would be dangerous. Another question from uh, the audience, uh, uh, Ignazio Martin, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. I'd like to know, could you comment on the stability of skirmions against uh, external magnetic fields, how the, the radius depends on the external magnetic field? I'm thinking on uh, real devices where you want to stack the components as closely as you can, and you may have stray fields. Ah, yeah. Um, okay, stray fields. You are right. You have stray fields. Uh, that's not good. Uh, the stray fields have the disadvantage of making the skirmion larger. And uh, we want to have small and compact skirmions. So therefore, we try to avoid this, uh, this stray field. One way to avoid the stray field is um, to work with these layered antiferromagnetic materials, which I was probably not very explicit in saying that. Uh, I was a little bit rushed at the end. So what you saw is I have this multi-layer stack. And in this multi-layer stack, you have ferromagnetic films, cobalt films. But the way you stack these cobalt films is that we stack them such that we have what we call synthetic antiferromagnets. So the one layer points up, the next layer points down, and we choose the intermediate layer such that this coupling is antiferromagnetic. So that we have certain stray field compensation. And this stray field compensation helps us to keep the skirmion small. Another object, another possibility would be to um, create a skirmion in an antiferromagnet. That's also possible. But then the detection might be a little bit more difficult. If typically, if you apply a magnetic, an external magnetic field, your skirmion is typically uh, becomes, yeah. So the skirmions which I mentioned to you had been skirmions without external field. But sometimes you can uh, add a small um, external field and you move a non-existing skirmion into or a non-existing magnetic pattern into a stability regime of the skirmion. Of course, if it's five Tesla, it doesn't help you very much. It is an academic. But uh, sometimes you have your small bias fields which you can implement in your multi-layer stack might move you into the right corner of the phase diagram where you can basically then stabilize your skirmion under a bias field. Uh, okay, thank you. So um, Christian is asking something, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, 
I want to ask Professor if uh, the, do the fact that uh, I3 has solved the problem of spin electronic on an tunnel. What's the origin of the Bash effect, Bash effect? Is it a perturbation on the Hamiltonian or uh, the fact know, that uh, you uh, uh, actually are solving the spin electronic in Hamiltonian by the correlation? Sorry, I, I wasn't quite sure. I didn't catch your question exactly. Uh, do you want to know uh, about the origin of the Rashba effect or? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, the yes, origin sir. of the Rashba effect uh, is in some sense. Uh, spin orbit interaction plus symmetry breaking. So uh, if you consider these two facts, rush by symmetry breaking plus spin orbit interaction, uh, then you can basically derive per perturbation theory and contribution to your Hamiltonian, which is the rush by effect. But the symmetry breaking cannot be arbitrary because there is a, uh, depending on your symmetry breaking, you have either the rush by effect or the Dresselhaus effect. For example, if you have a symmetry breaking, uh, like the symmetry breaking of a surface, which have, yeah, say called C2V, C4V, this type of uh, point groups, then you get a rush by effect. But if you have a different type of symmetry breaking, like uh, D2D, D, then, um, which is typically for gallium arsenide, for example, um, so that you have bulk, you have a broken bulk inversion, uh, then uh, you get a different type of uh, spin orbit Hamiltonian, which is the Dresselhaus Hamiltonian. So uh, if you have structure inversion symmetry breaking, you get a rush bar. If you get, um, uh, if you have a uh, bike inversion, you get a trestle house. Both of them are linear in spin orbit interaction. Yeah. And you can get more complicated things depending on your symmetry in orbitals. So uh, Stefan, there is a question from the streaming. Can you please comment on the role of SOC in designing the photobiotic systems? So back to the previous comment. Uh, in which systems? In? Photomagnonic system. That means manipulating spin through light pulses. Yes. Um, here is, of course, uh, the light enters basically as a vector potential and the vector potential couples to the spin and uh, through the spin by to the spin orbit interaction to the to the lattice that is my my picture okay i think we can uh, uh, get this last question so when we, when we put non-magnetic material on top of a material with large spin orbit coupling, does the strength of uh, cherushinsky moria interaction depends on the thickness of the, each material? Um, I showed in the talk the dependence of the rush bar strength as function of the depth. And you, you get exactly the same behavior for the gelatin, not the identical behavior, but the, the, an analogous behavior to the gelatinsky mori interaction. So if you have, for example, a magnetic material uh, in the vicinity of a material with strong spin orbit interaction, so the, 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 the wave function of the, so the, the, the electron of cobalt, of the magnetic materials, uh, moves, uh, uh, the electron hops to the platinum and maybe hops back and produce the jalachinsky moria interaction. But uh, the deeper it hops, the less is the contribution. So that means uh, the first, maybe the first platinum layer contributes most, then, the, then you have additional contribution from the second, from the third, from the fourth, from the fifth. But the contribution, the, the, the deeper you are, the deeper you, the, the, the thicker you go, the less is the additional contribution. 
And sometimes you have also a slightly oscillatory behavior. So maybe the first or the second platinum layer did add to a positive gelatin signal reaction. The third platinum layer adds, has a negative sign, but of smaller amplitude. It's like, like an RKQY interaction in the, D, in the DMI contribution. Okay. Okay, I think uh, we can uh, stop here and uh, we really thank uh, Stefan for this wonderful talk and for all these explanations. So thank you very much uh, once more. It was a real pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Sorry, I, I mismanaged the time a little bit. Uh, okay, sorry about this. It was okay, okay. Yeah. So thanks, see you soon. Yeah, have a great time. A good next week. Yeah, thank you.